Did you know that there are some bird species in which the male spends time making the nest? The male then, the female then lays its eggs in one of the male's nests. The male then incubates those eggs, and then the male takes care of the young. This is an extreme form of parental care, which is rarely seen in, in among all the different bird species. So this is an unusual uh, life history strategy uh, for the survival of this particular species, having the male do all this, this effort. So there's a lot of attention been paid to why is that? What what are the selective pressures? What are the what are the advantages of the male taking on this particular role? Uh, unlike a lot of birds, where it's the where maybe the female is taking the dominant role in parental care, and it's the female that chooses its chooses the mate. Here, the male is choosing the mate, choosing the female, and the female has to compete for that. So in this case, the females are typically larger. The females typically are more flamboyant uh, in terms of like coloration and, and feather patterns and so forth. And the male is a little more drab and matches its environment and fits in with its environment. Of course, the strategy there is if you're taking care of the young and you're going to be sitting on the nest, you need more, you know, cryptic, uh, you know, patterns that match your environment to protect you. Right, because it's very important that you don't you don't die. Whereas the flamboyant colors are there to attract a mate. They also attract you know uh, predators, which makes them more likely to be killed in the process. Um, it's usually the male that ends up being the one that is more in danger of losing its life than the female. But in this case, the the male birds are the ones that are more protected and and have a strategy for long term survival in order to protect the offspring. But well, that's, I'm going a little bit too far into that. We want to come back and I want to say that we're going to do a little episode of critiquing creationism here because creation.com and this particular author, Mark James, who is a got a bachelor's degree in chemistry and is the events coordinator for creation.com, has decided to take on uh, this question of the male jacana bird and its unusual family protection strategy. Uh, and as a, as evidence that uh, this could not have evolved. Uh, and so we're going to take a really short look at this particular article and discuss some of, we'll say, Mark James's misunderstandings of evolutionary theory. Uh, so let's just get right to it. Let's start reading this and see where this goes. At first glance, you might be forgiven to thinking that the bird in figure one is some sort of grotesque mutant. But you can see down here, it looks like it has a whole bunch of legs. Those are actually legs of the babies, the fledglings that have hatched. And there he's actually got his wings around them. He's holding them up and running around with all these little babies hanging down. All right, so this is, this is the male then that is taking care of those. This is a perfectly ordinary male bronze wing jacana. Chicana are freshwater shorebirds found in tropical and subtropical regions of India, Australia, Asia, Central and South America, and Africa. There's only eight species in this particular family of birds, the Chicana AC or something like that, um, which means that there's like, you know, basically one species per continent. <laughs> you know? um, so these are not common birds um, by any means. Um, this core, oh, and, and this is a really important component here. Chicanas belong to the Chicanidae family, in turn, is part of the shorebird created kind. Okay, remember we're talking creationist literature here. Creationists believe that all the different kinds of organisms were created separately. And there's always an effort to figure out what, what are those kinds, because they're not species. They're some kind of groups of similar things that might have evolved from some common ancestors that were originally created. And in this case, that common ancestor is the shore, what's called the shorebird created kind. And, and what does that correspond to in terms of like the, the secular literature or understanding of these birds? Well, that corresponds to the suborder Caridae, uh, I never know, it's Caridae, uh, or possibly the entire order that Caridae forms. And uh, boy, I got to show you what those are. All right. But this is important. You need to know what this particular family is. So let me show you that. All right, a diverse order of small to medium large birds. Here's this article, a creationist article saying that possibly this entire order or this large family are all one kind, meaning God just made one type of these. And then only two of these, 
or maybe seven total of, of one of these types was preserved on Noah's Ark. And therefore, all this diversity that I'm going to show you now has evolved from just a few common ancestors that made it through that bottleneck on Noah's flood only 4,500 years ago. And so 390 species, those are living species. That doesn't include the extinct species. So we'll say like 500-ish type species at least, all having come from just a couple. And what is the diversity of these? Well, we've got gulls, we have waders, and we have ox. So you have seagulls, you have your plovers, all right? And look at, there's some plovers that, you know, that fly enormous distances, amazing travelers, right? Uh, you've got your gulls, which live around, you know, oceans and they may eat fish. You've got other ones that are specialists on insects, all right? So they have diverse food, uh, they have diverse diets, they have diverse morphologies, they make diverse types of nests, right? They have diverse different types of behaviors. And the most important behavior you need to know that they differ in, you know, for what we're going to talk about here is, is their form of sexual selection and uh, their habit of reproduction, all right? Because we're mentioning the, the jacanas, all right? Here, the jacanas are, are, are male parenting, male choosing the female mate, uh, males making the nests, males raising the bird, raising the young, all right? A very um, a specific strategy, you know, for survival of that species. Whereas the killdeer, which which I like, and I just I just mentioned earlier, the killdeer are the male and the female look identical to one another. They share in almost 50-50 all of the duties from from raising the young, I mean, from from uh, sitting on the nest, right, to making the nest, share those responsibilities completely. And then, of course, there are other birds in this particular group in which the female is the one that does really all the labor, and the male's just there to deliver sperm and then flies off and does its own thing, uh, right? So that is a, uh, a very... Um, a maternal, you know, uh, focused uh, raising of the young. So all of those different diverse strategies exist in this one family. And here we have in this particular article, let's go back to the article now, right? So now here we have in this article, this could correspond to this entire order, this kind. So the jacanas, which represent this really unique, really specialized life cycle, all right, sexual selection, uh, form exist within a group of birds that really show like all the different kinds of diversity of different sexual selection forms and life habits. Now, let's see what they have to say. Let's see what um, uh, Mark James has to say about this. Also known as the lily trotters, jacanas have long slender legs. Uh, they live on lily pads. Um, they're unusual among birds. Females are as much as 60% larger than the males. Okay, that's uh, the reverse. Some of the other birds in this particular group, the females and the males are approximately the same size, right? And sometimes the, well, typically the males are actually a little bit larger than the females. So another feature they have is they're polyandrous, which means the females are known to mate with multiple males, right? Like all of your ducks and things that way. Now ducks aren't in this particular group, but that's a good example of a, uh, a type of bird that's polyandrous where the female will mate with many different males. Uh, but this isn't true within this particular family, all right? So many of the other shorebirds are uh, very dedicated to one um, mate, all right? So, for example, the killdeer, again. The killdeer have one mate, and they stay with that same mate the whole season, even may stay with that same mate for multiple years. So they're not having multiple mates. Um, and by the way, this is actually typical of if you see a strategy, if you observe birds, uh, and you observe that the male and the female are spending equal time taking care of the young, what you'll find is in almost all those cases, right, and very consistent, you'll find that that male is the only mate for that female. Um, so like geese, right, like Canadian geese, right, they're, they're sharing the duties. They look the same as the, the males and females have are hard to tell apart. Uh, and they're sharing, and they have they mate right either for life or at least for multiple seasons. And then the birds that uh, 
don't that mate multiple times, right? Where the female molts multiple times with other with multiple different males. Those are the ones where the males are like, eh, see you later. They they don't stick around. They don't help take care of the young. And the theory there is that they don't really know if the young are theirs because the female has made it with multiple different males. Uh, and if you don't know that that's your offspring, um, you're not really helping your own genes be propagated to the next generation because they might not even be your own genes. Whereas if you go and mate with five other females, then you just increase your chances of spreading your particular genotypes, your genetic information to the next generation. You're increasing the odds. But if you know that that female is the only mate, right? So this is like what happens in killdeer. Um, the male knows that like this female, I'm the only one, all right? And therefore the eggs are 50% mine in terms of the genetic information there. Uh, there's there's a, a reason for taking care of those young because you're actually propagating your particular genotypes uh, into the next generation. Okay, but uh, sorry, going into into some uh, some of my lecture format here. Okay, let's get back to the text. Uh, we were saying that the females are known to mate with multiple males in a harem type arrangement. In this case, the males birds then incubate the eggs and raise the chicks. That's what's especially unusual about this particular species or these four or five different species. All right. So then he goes on and talks about how, well, this is, this is kind of, this is really unusual. And he mentions evolutionists generally assume that in order to believe that a structure or a behavior evolved through mindless natural selection, it is sufficient to show that it bestows a survival advantage. Informed creationists, not just any creationist, but informed creationists have no problem with natural science. Okay, <laughs> like that's a that's a fun line, right? And it's it's kind of a that's kind of a uh, a stab at um, at some creationists who who say that natural selection isn't a real thing, right? No, we we understand natural selection is a real thing. However, they point out that the created feature designed for a purpose will obviously also be advantage to its possessor. They, all right, so. We believe in natural selection. Selection is selecting for characteristics that are best for survival. But all those characteristics that are there were created by God. So God created all those features, right? All those, um, all those characteristics. And then natural selection is simply the way that an environment is going to select which of those features that God has given it will, will best fit. Um, now, he's going to say that evolution fails in this case to explain males actually taking care of the young. Let's just say on the basis, on this basis, evolutionary evolutionists expect the males having evolved to do the child rearing would have had a high degree of certainty that they're raising their own offspring. But as apparent, this is not the case. Research into similarly, similar polyandrous wattle jacana indicate that the males have up to 74% chance of raising other males' chicks. As is often the case, the real empirical science confounds the evolutionary view. I mean, it's true that, um, in general, you would say that the males would prefer to raise their own young. There's a selective advantage to raising your, your own genes because then your, your, your fitness uh, is being passed down to the next generation. Uh, but there are many cases where the, the, the female always knows that it's her young, right? Because she made the egg. She, she knows that it's hers. Uh, the male's in a situation where it can't know because it didn't lay the egg. Uh, in this case, the female is, you know, polyandrous, so it is mated with multiple males, and then it comes and it says, "Hey, this male has a great nest. Right? <laughs> I'm going to use this male to raise my young." Puts the eggs in that particular nest. That male raises them, and in many cases, is raising another male's young right in that nest, um, and therefore propagating a different male's, you know, uh, genes. Now, really, the female is choosing the male, and the female might be choosing the male over certain characteristics that it sees in it, like that particular male, like, you know, I've been watching that male, and that male's a really good, for one thing, maybe that male is a, made an especially good nest for some other mate, right? Or that male is uh, very, very healthy, and there's cues uh, based on the overall the external morphology of whether male's successful or not, or maybe the male's call is very strong or whatever. Whatever that it is that the female senses that that male is has high fitness. 
So they're selecting that particular male, and then whatever genes that male has, some of those characteristics then are going to be part of the offspring from that female. Uh, and then, so even though it's another male raising those offspring, there's still going to be the potential for the next generation having better alleles as a result. Uh, so it's the female that's in charge, and she's choosing, like, she might be choosing, like, I like these characteristics in this male, but I'm going to lay the eggs in this other nest because this other male's, you know, shows some feature that suggests they're good at raising young. Um, so it's complicated, but, I mean, all, you know, ecological and uh, all species are complicated. There's many, many different selective factors at work. Uh, I would suggest that... Uh, you know, I just picked up my is my evolutionary biology text, and uh, there's a large discussion about different studies that have been done on these particular birds and the different selective pressures, uh, and how you end up getting this situation of male dominant or male uh, parent uh, parenting, which isn't mentioned in this particular article. So, you know, that's part of a, just this general uh, evolutionary text. So, I would think that this author should probably you know, have read a little bit more about these birds before starting to write about them. Um, but, you know, at the, at the end of the day, even if you might say that we don't fully understand, like, all the ins and outs of how you end up with a genetic combination of birds such that you have males doing the parenting, uh, even if they're parenting and taking care of eggs and offspring that actually don't have their genes in them at all, um, well, there's lots of parasitic organisms that do that all the time, so we know that's a common uh, feature across the animal kingdom. Um, but regardless of what the details are of how that happens, let's go back to this idea of, hey, these jacana birds, there's eight species. Now, what I don't think I've told you yet is one of those species has female raising the young and not the males. So it's the flip way around, and the females have more drab coloration, are smaller, and the males are larger and more flamboyant. So that's the same genus, just a different species. And that species has that other life strategy. Now, this author obviously believes that these birds are the same kind of thing. God just created a kind of shorebird. And then there was just two shorebirds on Noah's Ark. Those two shorebirds had offspring, and of those offspring, somehow their offspring each generation turned into different species that include seagulls, right? That included plovers, killdeer, ox, you know, all these different strategies. And this author, I'm sure, believes that, well, God placed a tremendous number of different kinds of genes to allow them to do these different things. But the real question here is, how did they get that way? What, what were the mechanisms that caused certain gene packages to get selected in certain environments such that you would have this behavior type? Right? You know, I, how did you get that? How did you get there? You would have gotten there through natural selection, Right? I mean, what, what mechanism is, is he going to employ to take eight species, eight descendants, all right, of this shorebird type? And of the eight, one of them, the female, is the one that chooses or raises the young. And then in six or seven others, it's the male that raises the young in a different environment. It seems like the environment somehow, there's something about that particular environment that there was some advantage to having the males actually raise the young, even if we don't fully understand it, right? I can't point to the exact mechanism and the exact genes that are causing that. One has to imagine that this is just one species giving rise to another, or I will say one species giving rise to more individuals, more individuals giving rise to more individuals, more individuals giving rise to individuals, and those individuals are becoming different and they are adapting to different locations and different places, becoming all these different species, taking on all these different characteristics, clearly you can evolve. Yeah? You can change from having a female raising young to male raising young. And that wasn't 
immediate creation. That wasn't like God just made them this way. I mean, this article kind of makes it sound that way, right? Kind of makes it sound like um, God just provided them with these features. God made the Jacana birds with this unusual behavior. But no, he made a type of bird that 390 other species of all the, the descendants of those birds, of those two birds on Ark, had what is sort of the more typical way of taking care of young. And then these other six or seven ended up with male-dominated, right? Patriarchy, right? Uh, in there. And so that's the thing that, you know, these articles leave out, right? That's the thing that I'm always left wanting. It's like, well, how did they get this way then? It's one thing to just say, like, this is the way God made them. But he apparently made them through a process. Unless they're going to invoke miracles. They're going to say, like, God made the shorebird. There was a killdeer. And then one day there was a killdeer. And then they gave, then they had an offspring. And that killdeer was a jacana. I mean, the, 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 the differences in the genes of those organisms is so great that, uh, for one thing, I find it hard to imagine it was all packaged into one original genome, that much variation. This is why we talk about hyper-evolution. Like, creationists have to believe in, in super rapid, accelerated rates of evolution, uh, which are unrealistic in terms of population genetic models. How would you sort out, the even if the variations existed, how would you sort them into these packages that are separate species that have their own unique variants that all have to work together very perfectly? Because most creationists will describe a bird like this, like the one in this picture here, as being incredibly well designed you know, for this particular environment. Um, but that design must be hundreds of different alleles, genetic variants, that are all working in symphony with one another to make this particular these particular features work for this particular organism. And that just doesn't come from chance because you know when, remember these birds are just crossing and swapping their genes and making all kinds of random combinations as they make their offspring. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to take a long time to hit upon the right combinations of these organisms to create what you're seeing today. See, we end up with this article with real, really no explanation, really, for why these animals are the way that they are, other than God did it. But we could have said that about every single species. But if you're going to say that God did it, um, but also that these birds all evolved through normal reproduction, all right? There was two birds in the ark, and they reproduced, just like we're watching birds reproduce today. They're reproducing after their own kind, right? They're making more of themselves. and um, But then they keep making more of themselves, but somehow they end up with making 400 different recognizable species. And in each species, there is uniformity of genetics such that you can easily identify thousands of individuals that are all belong to one species and they are distinctly separate from another species. Um, and all of that has to happen incredibly quickly. I mean, there's a lot of fossils of some of these members of these shorebirds. The fossils go back a long way and they look very much like some specific species that are alive today. So this all had to have happened very quickly right after they got off the ark. Um, it's all very complicated. Uh, it, it, this is just the same pattern. We could we could do this over and over and over. We could read these types of articles that come out every single week on different creationist um, pages, and they're like this. They're just like, well, here's this really weird feature. This really weird feature doesn't seem. You can't explain this by any by evolution. We, we do believe in natural selection, but it's almost as if he's saying natural selection really can't explain this, right? Because we think theoretically this shouldn't happen, so natural selection wouldn't be selecting. Why would they be selecting for males that don't uh, aren't raising their own young? And I, I could try to explain that. It would take a long time, and I would probably need to do it with a, another set of birds where there's been a lot more research done. Um, and we'd look at things like cuckoo birds and parasites, um, for which are very very successful, right, with that strategy. But if he's going to say that natural selection can't do this. But these birds weren't these birds when they got off the ark. 
they were a type of bird in which the the female was most likely in charge because 300 other members of this group the females in charge so the simplest explanation would be that that was the original version or form of this type of bird so if you're going to say you can't explain this behavior through natural selection then how are you going to explain it <laughs> it's like how are you going to explain how they got this way through natural reproduction over and over and over and over again from the arc kind what were the steps that took place such that this bird changed its behavior like one day you know one day the female laid some eggs the eggs hatched and two of the birds that came out were like i'm a male and you know what i'm taking over i'm gonna do all the parental care like i got some super magical combination that's radically different than my sisters uh and well but also they have to change their behavior too i mean the male can say i'm going to take over but if the if the female is genetically programmed to be the one that uh, takes care of the eggs there's going to be a fight right uh and so it's not as simple as simply getting one individual that just gets like well they just accidentally got the right combination which changed their behavior completely you got to have multiple individuals that have changed their behavior right? so that they will be in coordination with one another to be have any success at all otherwise the species is going to go extinct or that family is going to go extinct um yeah see it it just the more the more we dig into the details the more fantastical this particular explanation is here because it, it's not an explanation right there's, there's, there's no mechanism behind anything that's in this particular little article and that's what's always missing in these articles it's as if, and it's true, the audience really probably does buy this. This is complicated. This is too complex for natural science, natural selection to have done, therefore God. But this doesn't make sense in their own model of these were not like these birds three or 4,000 years ago. They have changed. You have to be explained how they made those changes. That is the next challenge for, for, for um, young earth creationists is to think about the mechanisms for how God actually acts and causes these changes. How is God guiding these changes? What, what's the mechanism for changing those? Is it lots of miracles? Is it a natural mechanism? If it's a nat, if it's what appears to be a natural mechanism, right? Then you need to find that mechanism and, and explain how you would get these features. Uh, what, you know what's going to happen if you do that? You're going to find out the natural selection actually can do this. <laughs> you're you're going to discover when you dig into the literature far enough, there's already plenty of evidence that natural selection acting on populations under certain types of, of environmental stress or environmental situations or competition will lead to this type of behavior. And that'll be your explanation. But this author kind of wants to make it sound like there's something more there than that, right? It's more than just that natural selection because that feels like the slippery slope to him. If, if we say that natural selection can do this, well, that's like saying natural selection can make a really complex trait, a really complex behavior. And since that complex behavior seems too complex to us, it's like giving away too much to natural selection. Uh, but if you don't, if you're not giving it away, you, you got to come up with an alternative explanation. You got to come up with an alternative hypothesis. There's there's no hypothesis here, at all. All right, I'm you know I'm I'm talking in circles now, saying the same things over and over again. I guess I'm just trying to, uh, it, as often I am doing, I'm perplexed myself to like put myself into the frame of mind of young Earth creationists and how they're thinking when they when they write stuff like this. Now, this person is a chemist. They don't really know biology very well. Uh, they know a couple features of these birds, but I would say haven't taken a deep dive into the evolutionary literature to really try to, try to truly understand some of the theoretical work behind this. Um, so in this case, I think that they just really don't know the complex situation they've jumped, they've gotten themselves into, all right? And uh, they're just writing a simple article with a very simple solution. God did it. Um, all right. Hey, thanks for, uh, you know, if you're still here after all of that, <laughs> thanks for hanging out with me. I will, uh, um, we'll explore something again later.
Talk to you later. Bye-bye.